again guys, welcome back to the channel. In today's video we are back for a full review of Just Flight's 146 Professional. The aircraft is arguably Microsoft Flight Simulator's first study level jet. This video will be a full review so as usual we'll be carrying out the full flight from cold and dark all the way through to shutdown. At the end of the video we'll finish up taking a little bit of a closer look at the external modelling and detailing, the same internally. We'll also take a brief look at the onboard tablet, see what sort of functionality we have there. And finally we'll finish up the video as ever with my overall thoughts and opinions on the product. Our flight today we're going to be operating a British Airways City Flyer route from London City Airport over towards Dublin. We'll be taking out the BAE 146-300, we've got about 100 passengers on board, around a tonne of cargo. We're going to be climbing our way up to flight level 280. It's a fairly nice quick sector for us, around 50 minutes in the air. And as ever the aim of the flight really to put the aircraft through its paces and see how well it behaves and how true to life it actually operates. As always guys, I do hope you enjoy the video and find it to be of use. If you do, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. As I say, we're going to jump straight into the flight, so we'll head for the flight deck of the 146 and begin running through our flight deck preparations. So welcome to the cockpit of the Just Flight 146 Professional once again. This time we are on the ground at London City and we've just gone on board the aircraft, run through a few of our flight deck safety checks. We'll continue on with the checklist, so the battery switches are both on. Both battery voltages have been checked, they're both above 23 volts. Bus ties are both set to auto. Standby inverter and standby generator are both set to arm. Generators 1 and 4 are both off. APU gen is off for the time being, as we've currently got the ground power cart powering up the aircraft. External AC is selected on. And the power supply is checked. Your dampers 1 and 2 can both go on, as can the Autopilot Master and the Avionics A and B Masters. Ground ignition can go to System A, brake fans will leave on for now, anti-skid can go on, and the lift spoilers for the yellow and the green systems can go on. Coming over to our air panel, for the time being we've got the packs off, we've got no bleed air coming from the APU as we just mentioned, currently we've got the GPU supplying the aircraft. Ram air switch is set to shut, APU air is selected off, flight deck and cabin temperatures are both set to auto, cabin fan and flight deck fan are both on, and coming over to the hydraulics panel now the AC pump can go on, and we'll get the PTU on, nav lights are on, flight instruments will check, so QNH is 1013, the altimeters are set there on the left, we've got showing just above 20 feet there on the primary and on the standby. One eight zero on that right now, three nine zero jet. Same there on the right. And on the HSIs, showing heading just left of north, so about 358. And we've got the same on the right. And the same on the compass. We'll come into RNAV for the departure. We'll be flying an RNAV departure, so we've got that now selected on the HSI. Flight enunciators are checked, we've got oil pressure on all four engines, ice protection, electrics, door not shut, part brake, flight deck recorder, we'll turn that on later on, got the external power and the screen heat, all of which we're expecting to see with the aircraft in its current configuration. Autopilot we can start setting up for the departure. We're going to be flying the Brookwinds Park 1 hotel departure today heading initially out towards the east. That's going to be based off the Brookmans Park VOR which is a frequency of 117.5 so we'll tune that up on NAV1. Delta 176, contact ground 1278, good morning. And we have 1175 on NAV1. We'll be tracking inbound towards Brookmans Park on a radial of 148. So we'll set that on my side. So we have 328 there on the left, and ultimately we're going to be tracking inbound towards Compton, 11435, we'll tune that up on the right. And we have 11435, and that's going to be on a course of 225, so again we'll select that for our course on the right. Okay, 
So just working our way down towards 225. And we have 225 set. And lastly you can see that the SID also uses the Henton NDB which is a frequency of 433.5. And so we'll set that up as well. And we have 433.5. We'll go to ADF. And lastly, in terms of setting up the autopilot for the departure, initial climb restriction is 3,000 feet. So we can set that on the autopilot. 1, 1, 3, 5, 6, 5, 5, right there, 1, 8, Bravo, Victor, bye. There's 3,000, we'll get the flight directors on. And we can arm that up ahead of time. So flight instruments are checked, flight enunciators have been checked, the autopilot is set. We can now come down to the MCDU and we'll begin programming that for our flight. So coming down now to the CDU and once again we're going to be taking a pretty close look at this throughout the flight today given that we do have the working title software running in the background. Firstly you can see that the active database is currently out of date, we're showing October the 7th through to November the 3rd of 2021 there which is a little bit strange given that the secondary database is actually uh, more up to date, that's just out of date currently. Doesn't seem though as though we can actually swap the two databases around, but we'll leave that for the time being. I'm sure that it will be sufficient for today's flight, although of course in reality you'd like to see a valid active database. So coming to Posinit, ordinarily I'd try and align based on the GPS position, but if we go to next page there, it doesn't actually look like we can select the uh, GNSS coordinates there. If we do come back to the previous page though, you can see we've already got the correct position inserted there for us. So the navigation should be valid, although it would be nice to be able to uh, set that ourselves. Next over to the flight plan page, departure is going to be London City, Echo, Golf, Lima, Charlie. And we're bound for Dublin, which is Echo, India, Delta, Whiskey. Alternate for our flight today is Belfast, that's Older Grove, so Echo, Golf, Alpha, Alpha. And once again, it looks like we can't currently uh, select an alternate, so there are a few deficiencies currently with the uh, CDU. Anyway, in terms of our departure, we're going to be departing out towards the east, so off runway 09, and once again it's going to be the uh, Brookmans Park Arnav departure, which is the uh, one hotel. And we have that inserted, so we can hit Execute. Coming back to the flight plan page, so the Brookmans Park 1 Hotel departure obviously takes us out towards Brookmans Park. In terms of our flight number, we're going to be Speedbird 4470. And on now to the next page. So running through our flight plan out towards Brookmans Park as we discussed. After that we're going to be taking the up November 601 airway. Jumps down to go. And from there it will be on towards waypoint to Leicester, which is Lima, Echo, Sierra, Tango, Alpha. Then it will be the Uniform Papa 6 airway. And that will have us tracking on towards waypoint Rodol, which is Romeo, Oscar, Delta, Oscar, Lima. Then it will be Uniform Lima 2.8. And that will be on towards waypoint Leldo, which is Lima, Echo, Lima, Delta, Oscar. And then it will be the Mike 145. And that's going to have us tracking out towards waypoint Baxo, which is Bravo, Alpha, Golf, Sierra, Oscar. So once again, just quickly checking through those waypoints, they are all correct, we'll hit Execute. For the arrival we are coming in via waypoint Bagso, and that's going to be onto runway 28 left. So again we'll go to next page, we're looking for the ILS. And it's going to be the Bagso to X-ray arrival, we'll just wait for the uh, CDU to finish calculating there. Okay so after a little bit of time there the CDU actually did just continue to state working, so we selected the Bagso to X-ray and that straight away fixed the issue. So. 
It does seem as though the uh, the working message there perhaps slightly incorrect. Certainly on the Airbus, if you see please wait, you want to actually wait until things have completed, but it seems with the uh, 146 you're better off just plowing ahead. So we have the ILS-28 left, the Bagso 2 X-ray arrival. Once again we'll hit Execute. And now onto the legs page, we'll just run through our legs, make sure everything's correct there. So from Bagso, tracking out towards uh, waypoint ADSYS. And I think we can join those two waypoints up, we'll just double check that with our charts. And indeed we do want to go from uh, Bagso in towards ADSYS, so we'll join those two up. And again we can hit Execute. And then that brings us in towards uh, waypoint Lapmo onto the ILS for 28 left. So the legs page looks good, we'll go back to the index. We've run through the status page, run through Posnit. And onto the next page. So it looks at the moment as though we only have the option to set up the uh, flight plan in the MCDU. It doesn't look as though we can set up any performance data. That's a little bit of a shame. Certainly the uh, X-Plane version of the aircraft does offer that functionality. Of course I assume that Just Flight will add that at a later date. For the time being then we'll go to progress page on my side and it looks like that's going to automatically set there on the first officer side as well. Obviously we have the EFB, we'll be using that later on for the briefing but while we're down here we'll brief the departure here out of London City. Again we're going to be departing off runway 09 via the Brookmans Park 1 Hotel Arnav departure. It is an Arnav SID, it's plate 40-3 Lima. Straight ahead to Lima Charlie Echo 01. Maximum speed of 200 knots initially until we've made the turn. Climbing up to an altitude of 3,000 feet. We'll be making a left turn to track inbound towards Brookman's Park. Again, we got that tuned up on Nav 1 with the radial of 328 inbound. And we have no turns below 570 feet. Aerodrome elevation is 20 feet. Transition altitude for the departure is 6,000. In terms of the terrain, there's no significant terrain around London City. The highest sector MSA is out towards the southeast. That's 2,300 feet. We're departing out towards the 2,100 foot sector MSA. Weather-wise, it's absolutely fine. There is a little bit of cloud on the climb, so depending on the outside air temperature, we may have to take the uh, engine anti-ice on. Otherwise, though, it's a nice day. We do have a slight tailwind off runway 09, but that's the runway that's been given to us by air traffic. Anyway, as we wait for our passengers to continue boarding here, we'll just make our way through the cabin briefly, take a look at that, and we'll come back to the flight deck once everyone's on board, and we are ready for the start. Okay, so a quick tour of the cabin there. Interestingly, we actually had to use the drone camera to walk our way through the cabin. It seems currently the cabin's not modelled internally, at least going through from the cockpit. I seem to recall that when we looked at the 100 variant of the aircraft previously that the cabin was modelled, so it looks like the 300 variant still needs a little bit of modelling there. Anyway, everyone's on board now, the doors are closed up, so running through our before start checks. The briefing is complete, brakes are set to park, hydraulic pressure looks good there on the yellow system. Hydraulics can go off, so we'll get rid of the PTU and the AC pump can go off. Fuel panel is checked, we want 6.4 tonnes for the flight and we've got 6.4 tonnes on board. Lights and notices, we have the passenger signs on, flight deck emergency lights are set to arm. No smoking signs are set to auto and the cabin emergency lights also set to arm. Air conditioning is set as required, the packs can come off. Thrust levers are in the fuel off position. Altimeters are set. We have QNH of 1013 across the board. AC power is set as required. TMS, N1s, and V speeds. So we've set up the uh, TMS for the departure. OAT currently around 17 degrees, so we've set that up. That's giving us an N1 of 93% for the takeoff. And we've set that on all four gauges. We've got a target temperature of 820 degrees for later on during the climb. And 42 tonnes takeoff weight. It's going to be a flaps 18 takeoff. That's giving us a VR of 136, VTO of 140, and a VFTO of 186 knots. Flight directors are both on. Trims are set. 
Beacon light can go on. Packs and APU air. So the packs are off, APU air can come off. Engine anti-ice is off. Brake fans are off. AC pump is off. Fuel pumps can go on. Start panel we can set. So start master can go on. We'll be starting the number one first. And the transponder. We'll just leave ourselves walking 7,000. And we'll go TA, RA and to above for the climb. So we are ready for the start. No push today, of course. We're facing out already towards the main taxiway. We are cleared now for the start, so we'll hit the starter on the number one engine. And you can see there we do have N1 rotation, N2 coming up as well. Just waiting till we see around 20% there on the M1. And we can now introduce the fuel onto the engine. So fuel on. There's our rise in fuel flow. And there's our rise in TGT. I mentioned during the preview, but I do like the animation there on the gauges. I think particularly the uh, numbers there on the gauge spool up at quite a nice realistic rate. Apparently though, they do produce quite a lot of noise in real life, which obviously you can't hear here on the aircraft, so it might be nice to have that addition at a later date. Anyway, TGT looking good, engine's just about stable, all temperatures and pressures looking good, so we have a good start there on the number one, we'll start the number two. Same as before, so we have number two selected, we'll hit the starter. Final one X-ray November, good morning, identified, climb flight number 100. And there's our 20%. So the fuel can go on for the number two. There's our rising fuel flow. And TGT coming up. M1 and N2 continuing to rise. All temperature and pressure looking good. And just waiting on the number two to stabilise. And it looks like we do have a good start there on the number two. The engine is now stable. As usual, we'll head outside so that you can hear the start sounds externally. And we'll come back once we've got four good starts and we're more or less ready for the taxi. Right, so we have all four engines started, running through the after start checks, we can set the start panel. So the engine start selector can go off, start master can go off. Engine anti-ice is not required, generators can go on. So there's generator 1 and generator 4. External AC is off. Brake fans will leave off for now. Hydraulics. Are on. PSI coming up there on both systems. Heaters. We'll get the screen heats. And the Peter heats on. Speeds in M1. Once again, we have our V speed set, our M1 bug set. APU air can stay off, engine air can go on. Packs can go on. Cabin air will leave in recirc. And for the cabin temps, we'll leave those in auto. So we are now ready for the taxi, we're just joining straight ahead here onto the main taxiway and then left down to Alpha for the holding point. There'll be a full length departure off runway 09. So the park brake can come off. We are all clear on the right, we'll just come up slightly on the thrust levers here to get the aircraft moving. And just needing a little bit of thrust here to get the aircraft rolling, but we are pretty heavy today so that's quite reasonable. 
We'll do a quick brake check. So the brakes are checked. Flaps, again, it's going to be a Flaps 18 takeoff. We have Flaps 18 selected. So joining left here onto the main taxiway. And we've got holding point Delta just off the nose. Again, taxiing down for Alpha. Air permit, South of Stockliser, Turkish 9 Ridge Whiskey. Turkish 9 Ridge Whiskey, thank you. Report your distance to push down to tower 118. You can see the London CBD just off the nose as well. We should get a bit of a view of that as we turn back out towards the west later on. So for the flaps, we have flaps 18 indicated. Flight instruments are checked. Trims are checked. We'll run a takeoff config test. And no warning there, so the aircraft is configured for the takeoff. Continuous ignition can go on. Flight controls, we have full up, full down, and neutral, full left, full right, and neutral. Just coming up from Bravo, so next right will be Alpha, slowing the aircraft down for the holding point. So flight controls are checked, and landing lights can now come on in preparation for the takeoff. Get the strobes on as well. And we are all clear on final. We'll get ourselves lined up here on runway 09. 118 decimal 6, uh, with the distance to touchdown. Search 9 rate with you, right? And again, no traffic coming down the ILS. And nothing departing. Okay, so we are all set once again, just as a reminder for the departure brief. So we're tracking runway 09 initially out towards Lima Charlie, Echo 01, making a left turn out towards the northwest, tracking inbound towards the Brookmans Park VOR. Climbing up to an altitude of 3,000 feet, and we've got the 200 knot speed restriction in the turn. We're going to be flying all of that in RNAV. The park brake is off. Pretty short takeoff run here out of London City, so we'll hold the aircraft on the brakes as we let the engine stabilise. And take off. Power set, flex achieved. That's checked. Speed alive, both sides. 80 knots, of course, checked. Okay, yeah, it's coming back on the oak. V2. Now yeah, we have positive climb. Gear can come up. Pitching for around 15 degrees. We'll talk more about how the aircraft hand flies once you've actually completed the departure here.
Yeah, just come out through 1500 feet, so we'll go to sync on the TMS. And we'll go to vertical speed. It's one to go. Just bring the pitch down to around 10 degrees for the time being, just to let the aircraft accelerate a little. We're well below our 200 knot speed restriction. And as we accelerate, we can start retracting the flaps. We've got out armed there on the FMA, so the flight director should give us out capture. And we'll slowly start reducing that thrust. So looking good there now on the flight directors, we'll get the autopilot in. There's the yaw damper and the autopilot. Speed is checked, the flaps can come up. Maintaining 3,000 feet, tracking inbound towards the next waypoint. We'll set the speed bug now up to 250 knots. We've made our turn, so we've passed through our 200 knot speed restriction. And we'll just keep the thrust as is for the time being until we reach 250 knots. So there's 250, coming back on the thrust levers. So far the aircraft flying the departure fairly nicely there, so the onboard FMC doing a reasonable job thus far. Ever so slightly overshooting the turn there, and we're just getting a little bit fast, so continuing to come back on the power. Come into some clouds. Outside air temperature, just coming below 10 degrees, we'll take the engine anti-ice on. And running through the after takeoff checks, the gear is up, the lights are out, flaps, we have zero indicated. TMS is set, engine air is on, APU air is off, packs are on, APU can come off. And we'll get rid of the continuous ignition. So continuing to track inbound towards Brookmans Park, you can see we've got around six miles to run there. And we'll assume now that air traffic has given us further climb, so we'll go up to uh, flight level 110. So we have 110 selected, we'll cancel the caution, that was just a uh, transitionary caution there for the APU. We'll arm that up once again and we'll go into uh, IS holds, start feeding in the thrust and the aircraft should maintain the speed here as we climb. Through flight level 210, still maintaining 820 degrees there on the TGT. That's giving us now a climb of around 1500 feet per minute. And so far we've burned our way through about 200 kilos on each of the engines. Just coming below uh, 6 tonnes of fuel on board the aircraft. Cam pressure looks good. And as ever in the sim, the view out of the window looks good as well. As we climb here, we'll get the charts up for Dublin. So Echo India Delta Whiskey. 
Interestingly there, it's actually logged me out. A little bit of inconvenience. Uh, we're not going to be bothering to authenticate again there. I did do that earlier on. That may be a slight issue with the aircraft currently, so we'll do away with the charts on the EFB for now. We'll just use a uh, paper chart here for the arrival into Dublin. We'll brief that up later on. A little bit of a shame though, I'm not quite sure why it logged us out. So, so far I'm really enjoying the aircraft. It's certainly the best jet that we've seen in the sim to date. There are a couple of issues though that do seem to need uh, cleaning up still with the 146. Namely, so far we've obviously discussed the cabin. I'm a little bit surprised there that we got logged out of Navigraph. We've only been in the aircraft for about an hour overall. Just coming up on Mach point six five, and coming up on flight level two four zero, so another four thousand feet. Once again, just confirming we do have the out armed there, so we should capture at flight level two eight zero. And as ever, manual thrust in the one four six. So we'll have to remember to come back on the thrust levers. But for me, this is a really fun aircraft. I mentioned it during my preview, and it's really what flying these sorts of aircraft is all about. Very hands-on. I love having the steam gauges. It certainly makes you think a little bit more about what you're doing. Even with the FMC now, obviously that does help us a little bit. But you've still got to keep a good eye on the uh, instruments and really fly the aircraft. There's not that much automation that you can totally rely on it for the flight. And it just makes everything a lot more interesting, a little more challenging as well. So for me, the 146 and the, uh, the Mad Dog, which should be releasing imminently. They're really the two aircraft that I'm personally looking very much forward to in the sim. I'm very much looking forward to the 737 as well, but I know for me these two aircraft are a little bit more interesting to fly, generally speaking. Although I am certainly a big fan of the 737. So that's flight level 250. Still looking good on speed. Doing about Mach point uh, six seven now. And in terms of the aircraft position, we're just coming overhead uh, Peachborough. That should be out on the right. A little bit tricky to see with the cloud cover. We've got uh, Leicester just off the nose, which makes sense because we should have, uh, sure enough, Waypoint Leicester on our flight plan. So Leicester just out on our left. Just about make that out, I think. And then we've got uh, Derby and Nottingham further up north. Up through flight level 260. We'll continue to track northwest bound essentially. Just passing out towards the south of Manchester. We'll be crossing over the coast just out to the north of Liverpool. And getting ready now for the aircraft to level off, so we'll keep a good eye on the altimeter. And again, keeping a good eye on our SB to make sure that we don't go through our maximum Mach number, which we're looking fine for at the moment. So there's one to go. And just coming up on Mach point seven. So it looks like we'll be maintaining a uh, cruise speed as opposed to a cruising Mach number. And showing uh, 220 miles to run now, so we've got about 100 miles in which we can get the aircraft set up for the arrival. So that's going to be a little bit over 10 minutes in terms of flight time. Just starting to reduce the thrust, the speed is slowly creeping up there. And the aircraft levelling us off nicely, so overall the automation did a pretty good job. Did tend to slightly overshoot the turns there on the departure. And not the smoothest automation I've seen overall, but again, it's pretty basic automation on the 146, so it's not entirely surprising. And the FMC did do the job we needed in terms of getting us from London City up towards the cruise.
Line at 9 Hotel, November, good morning. Line up on the way to the left. Five eight contact Dublin one two nine that's one one eight zero goodbye. Nine one eight zero Shamrock three two eight. Drop for the Shamrock two three whiskey. Hey from Shamrock uh, two three whiskey. Uh. Hey Shamrock two three whiskey, you stay with me. Roger. Just about that frequency is one two nine one eight zero for the Shamrock one five eight. That's it. Thanks. Bye. So welcome back to the flight deck. We are just coming up on 120 miles to run towards Dublin, which as we said is our calculated top descent. That's fairly conservative, but that will give us plenty of time to get things figured out in the BAE 146 today. So once again we'll set the aircraft up for the descent. We'll descend initially down to uh, flight level 100, as that's the first restriction on the departure. We need to be below 100 at waypoint Bagso. So we have flight level 100 selected, we'll go into out arm and we'll come into IES hold. We'll start coming back on the thrust. Ground speed's 424 knots, so we need a descent rate of around 2,000 feet per minute to give us a uh, 3 degree profile. So we'll just come back on the thrust levers till we see around 2,000 feet per minute rate of descent. Flight level 5, 3, Delta, Tango, Dublin, good day, back to 2, Lima, descent, flight level 8, 0. Flight level 8, 0, back to 2, Lima, right now, 5, 3, Delta, Tango. We'll keep a good eye on the uh, FMC, really we want to see our distance to run towards uh, Bagso for that restriction. For the time being though, just using our distance to run should work absolutely fine. We'll tune up the uh, frequency now on Nav 1 for the Dublin ILS, already showing 100 miles to run towards the Dublin VOR there. And what we're going to do here, we'll track in towards uh, Bagso and then we'll try and cut the corner to going straight in towards uh, waypoint Kogax. Firstly that should put us a little bit high so we'll try and correct that just to see how the aircraft handles it. But more importantly we're going to use that as a little bit of a test of the functionality of the FMC. Certainly the default FMC in the sim doesn't seem to like doing direct twos, it often tends to mess up the flight plan so we're going to see how the FMC behaves there. For the time being though we'll run through our descent checks. So for the descent, the PTU is on, pressurisation is checked, landing flap, it's going to be a flap 30 landing, so VREF will be 128, we'll set that later on, and TMS we can set now to descent, that's going to manage the N1s for us on the engines to give us enough bleed air for the cabin pressurisation, engine anti-ice systems of that nature. Transition level into Dublin is by air traffic, so we'll just call transition 10,000 feet as we come back on the speed, we'll set the altimeters at the same time. Anyway, our descent checks are complete, just coming up on uh, flight level 250, that means we need 100 miles to run. And bang on 100 miles at the moment, so nicely on profile. You can see though that that vertical speed is a little bit less than we wanted. So again, coming back on the thrust to try and get us closer to 2,000 feet per minute on the rate of descent. 
The tower, hello, runner 32 Tango, Julia, the tower is silent, 28 and left, pass max. Minor 3 Tango, good morning, continue. Number 1, the wind is 290 degrees, 3 0 now, max 3 x. 3 2 Tango, good day. So it looks like around 50% on the M1 is going to give us about 2,000 feet per minute. And we will be coming back into the weather fairly shortly, so we'll get the engine anti-ice on once again. Similarly, we'll just get the passengers sat down a little bit early here. Just so that they're not getting bumped around in the weather. Ground speed now back at 400 knots, so again 2,000 feet per minute is going to work absolutely fine for our descent rate. What we can do here is we go to the legs page, so we've got waypoint Bagzo. We want to go from Bagzo out towards waypoint Kogax, so we'll select Kogax and uh, Adsys is the next waypoint after Bagzo. So we've got Bagso to Kogax, we'll execute that. And so far still tracking correctly to the next waypoint, so it looks as though the FMC's handled that quite nicely. We'll try going Direct 2 uh, Kogax again later on if I remember, just to see whether or not Direct 2 works reasonably well. Showing 80 miles now to run towards Dublin with that shortcut. And flight level 220, so we need about uh, 88 miles to run. So just getting a touch higher, again coming back off that thrust. With the TMS set to descent there, it looks like around 53% in one is all the aircraft's actually going to allow us to set. For the time being, pretty happy that we're still reasonably within limits on our profile, so we're not going to take the speed break. We'll see whether or not we regain the profile here in the descent. And three miles to run to waypoint Lanva. We'll be staying in RNAV for most of the arrival. We'll just come back into conventional navigation as we come through waypoint Latmo on the RLS. Just coming back into the weather. A little bit of a bump in the clouds there. Again, we got the passengers sat down. And coming up on uh, flight level 120, it's another 2,000 feet to lose before Bagso. We used to be about 8 miles, we've got about 14, so we're looking good in terms of profile. Again, flying things nice and conservatively. QNH in Dublin is actually 1013 as well, so we can just leave the altimeters as we come through transition. We'll set 250 knots now on our speed bug. And we'll come back into vertical speed. We'll hit sync. And again, we'll just reduce the vertical speed back to around 1,000 feet per minute. Ten miles to run to back, so we've got 1,000 feet to lose. Speed is rolling off, but not very quickly, so we'll just take a little bit more speed break. Minor three, Tango two, indicate right zero four, right hand zero. Okay, zero four, right zero right, three two seven zero. There's one to go. We'll continue the descent. We'll go down to 3,000 now. Again, that's our intercept altitude for the RLS. So there's 3,000. We have out arm. And there's 250 knots. Thank you. 
We do actually have the restriction of flight level 80 at uh, Kogak, so we'll fly that first. So we have flight level 80, out arm. And we have 2,000 feet to lose, just coming up on uh, waypoint bag, so, so looking good now in terms of our profile. We'll get rid of the speed brake. And from Bagso through to Kogax, we've got about uh, 10 miles there. And we've got about another 1,500 feet to lose. We're not getting a particularly great descent rate there with no speed brake. And again, we do need to be at 8,000, so we'll take a little bit again just to help get the aircraft down. We'll get ourselves levelled off before we come through Kogax. So again, there's one to go, we've got eight miles. And getting rid of the speed brake, quite happy now that the aircraft's going to make the restriction. And once we come through Kogax, again we can descend down to 3000 for the intercept onto the RLS. Just make out some of the land now out towards the uh, southwest of us. And you can see the coastline there off to our 2 o'clock. Down through 10,000, so we'll get the landing lights on. We'll cycle the seatbelt signs. And we've got a uh, 180 knot speed restriction at waypoint Latmo, so we'll have to decelerate the aircraft again once we come through Kogax. Another one and a half miles to run to Latmo. It'll be interesting to see how the aircraft puts us onto the RLS, whether or not it manages the turn here. So there's some one to go. And there's out. We'll get the heading bug ready just in case, so we'll be turning off to heading of 280 for the RLS. Coming back to 160 knots now. And it looks like the aircraft did turn us okay, although it is going to have us overshooting slightly there. We'll come back onto a reasonable intercept. And we'll go into heading. Find that the click spots there on the autopilot are a touch fiddly at times. Don't always get the mode as you press it. Anyway, we are in heading now, so we'll come back into conventional navigation. Showing the localizer and the glide slope. We'll arm up the loc. And same there on the glides. Coming up on the thrust to maintain 160 knots for now. There's the glide slope. Just hold the gear till we come through 8 miles. You can already see runway 28 left off the nose. Mr. Approach altitude we said was a maximum of 3,000 feet. We have 3,000 feet set. We'll take another stage of flap. And there's our 8 miles, so the gear can come down. For the approach checks, the altimeters are set, seatbelt signs are on. APU not required, ignition can go on. We can get rid of that engine anti ice as well now. So just letting the speed bleed back towards uh, VREF, which we said was 128. The aircraft is a little bit pitchy there, you can see maintaining the ILS. We've got a little bit of an oscillation there as we come down the glide slope. For the landing checks, we have gear down, three greens, brakes are checked. 
flaps. We'll go with flaps 30. Again, that's our landing flap setting. Anti-ice not required. Landing lights are on. That's our landing checklist complete. So it's coming back off the thrust now to maintain our V-Ref. Looks like the aircraft is settling us onto the ILS. Doing a little bit of a better job now at tracking that uh, glide slope. We'll bring our speed reference bug here as well back towards VREF, just to help us fly the speed a little bit more accurately. So once again, as per the brief landing 28 left, plane to vacate off to the right. Just come overhead the outer marker. Got two reds, two whites there on the pappy. Speed check below 145. Select flap 33. Again, we're going to be flaps 30 for landing, so we'll disregard that. And again, now that we are established on the ILS, the aircraft seems to be flying it just fine. Sad to say, but it is still an issue in the sim that certain aircraft don't fly the ILS very well. Right, sir, 416, hello, continue on your lap of Zulim at descent side number 100. 100, all of the Zulim, speed 250, And just came up on a 1,000 feet rad out. 1,000. That's checked, we are stable. And configured for the landing. Chairman 524, clear direct passage. Clear direct passage, Chairman 524. So we'll get rid of the autopilot. Autopilot disconnected. In terms of hand flying, so far the aircraft feels reasonable. A little bit sensitive on the controls perhaps. Just getting a touch high on the glide, so we'll correct for that. Let's check. Actually, overall, the controls don't feel too bad. The aircraft does have a little bit of inertia to it as well. We're showing on the glide slope, we're showing a little bit low on the pappy. That's probably a sim issue as opposed to an aircraft issue. So, as the MDA, we'll continue. Cutting the thrust. Yeah. Let's touch down. Yellow and green spoilers. Brake pressure seen. Spoilers are up. Coming onto the brakes, we'll take the second exit on the right. 80 knots. And just off the brakes again, letting the aircraft roll through. We'll try and keep our time on the runway minimised. So we're going to be crossing a runway once again, we'll get the strobe lights on. And as you expect, a few Aer Lingus aircraft there off from the southern apron. Again, just getting the aircraft slowed down here as we come across the uh, active runway. And as best we can see, it's all clear out to the right. Certainly all clear out to the left. 
Turn on uniform Bravo in 290 degrees, 26 knots, max 37, on way to Alaska, check out the morning. So coming straight across, as I said, we'll come on to uh, link two. Looks like that is actually labelled accurately, interestingly enough. And there's quite a few uh, empty gates there off the tower 11 o'clock, so we'll take one of those. We'll get the APU fired up as we come onto the bay. And again onto the brakes, so we're coming on the uh, bay that's straight off the nose. So taxi lights can go off. No, no, and uh, speed restriction will be approaching care up. And as usual, there's not much in terms of any taxi guidance. The, uh, the gate there doesn't look to be particularly accurate in terms of its placement, so we'll just place the aircraft in a reasonable location. We'll be vacating via the air stairs at any rate. So onto the brakes. Aircraft is stationary, the park brake can go on. APU is available and we do have the uh, APU generator on there. So running through the shutdown checks, the brakes are set to park, pressure is checked. Lights are set, pressurisation is checked, hydraulics can go off. And you can see the pressure there winding down on both systems. Generators 1 and 4 can both go off. So we now have the APU powering the aircraft. And we are now ready for the shutdown, so the fuel levers can go to the fuel off position. 1 1 uh, 0, and we'll hurry through 12,000, and we are trying to hurry down. 9 9 Thank you. Heading through, doors to 9 Newton Crosscheck. There's four good shutdowns. Fasten seatbelt signs can go off. Brake fans not required. Fuel pumps. Just leaving the left inner on there for the APU. Fuel pumps are off. Engine anti-ice is off. Beacon is off. And transponder. Is set to standby. That's the shutdown checklist complete. We'll get the door opened up momentarily. As I say, we'll be using the air stairs to disembark our passengers. So there you go guys, I hope you enjoyed our outing in the Just Flight 146 Professional. As I've mentioned on a couple of occasions now, for me the 146 is a really good, fun, interesting little jet to fly. Obviously during the flight we didn't get that much time to look at some of the finer details, so we'll do that now before we finish up the review. Firstly, taking a slightly closer look at the external model of the aircraft, and once again, as ever really, Just Flight have done a very wonderful job with the 146. As is fairly typical of their range, I would say that the modelling detail is really nice, the texturing detail is good, although Just Flight's texturing does tend to be a little bit lower resolution than some other add-on developers. Again though, modelling detailing, very nice. You can see here we've got the door very well modelled, we've got the air stairs as well. All of the various static ports, pitot tubes, radio antenna, everything's modelled as you'd expect on the aircraft. And certainly worthy of mention, with the package you do get a plethora of different variants and liveries of the 146. So really you're getting a lot of bang for your buck in terms of different aircraft variants. Using the left main landing gear leg as an example here, you can see that again the modelling detail is very nice. I would say that the modelling detail is perhaps just shy of the very best aircraft that we've seen in the sim to date. Although it's still above most of the current competition, for example I would say the aircraft is modelled to a higher degree than the Aerosoft CRJ for example. And the texturing quality doesn't quite hold up as well externally as it does internally. For example, you can see there, there's a panel line that doesn't quite match up, and a few of the logo textures as well, just a little bit on the lower resolution side. Certainly though, from a distance, the aircraft looks really nice. The PBR has done very well, as ever. It's really just when you get close up to the aircraft you do notice. A few of the finer details could be finessed. Internally though, for me, is where the 146 really shines, so let's head for the cockpit. Once again, obviously we saw quite a bit of that during our flight, but we'll just touch on a few more details. As I say for me, the cockpit of the 146 is really the product's forte. I think the cockpit looks excellent, it's one of the best cockpits that we've seen in the sim to date. Instrumentation is modelled very nicely, very smooth, very crisp, for the most part very easy to read, although there are a few exceptions there. The flight director, for example, is a bit tricky to read, and obviously that is quite an important feature of the overall instrumentation. The same goes for the FMA, it is readable, but a little bit tricky at times. 
We've touched already briefly on the FMC. I would say that that is currently one of the product's weaknesses. The 146 Professional currently uses the working title software essentially behind the scenes of the FMC. And as we've seen already, the functionality there is somewhat limited currently. Just like they have stated that the aircraft will get a fully customised FMC at a later date. And as I mentioned earlier, they did the same thing in X-Plane 11. For now though, the functionality is sufficient to get the aircraft from A to B. And as we saw, I did try a couple of tricks along the way. Again though, it is just a question of, for that price point, you would want to see a little bit more functionality, I think. In terms of the weather radar and the terrain display, currently I believe neither of those are modelled. Just flight, as with most add-on developers, are waiting for Sobo to finally lay down the SDK requirements for the weather to be displayed correctly in the aircraft. That's fair enough, I think if it's a case of choosing between a bodge job or no weather radar, for the time being I can certainly live without the weather radar. Systems wise, for me I thought the aircraft was great. I wasn't very surprised though, the Just Like 146 is excellent in X-Plane 11, it's one of my real go-to aircraft. Whether or not it's study level really depends on your definition, I know that Just Fight themselves don't tend to use the term. I do, as I think it offers a pretty decent, easy, quick way of understanding roughly what you're getting with the product. By my definition I would say the product is study level, for me, I would class an aircraft as study level if you can meaningfully use it to study for a type rating for example, and you certainly could here with a 146. The overall systems modelling is pretty excellent, particularly in the normal range of operations. There are certain features that aren't modelled though, there's no failure modelling. The circuit breakers for example aren't modelled, although most of the test functionality is. It's nice as well, I don't know whether or not it's true to life of the real world aircraft, but as you'll have seen during the flight you do get the odd caution or warning as you get various transients through the electrical or the hydraulic system. So it's quite clear that everything isn't just for show, there is quite a bit of modelling going on behind the scenes as well in terms of the systems. Modelling throughout the cockpit is really nice, everything's modelled very well. All the textures are very crisp and very clear, you can see the placard there for example on the left hand pilot's window. Not everything is clickable, for example you can't operate the oxygen masks, there are certain little features that you might see in other aircraft. But again overall I think most of the functionality that you'd want is there, and for me the aircraft is very comprehensive. Touching on the night lighting, I think the night lighting for the most part very good. I really like the strip lighting there on the panel, I think that looks excellent. Overall the lighting does look very good, the overhead perhaps looks ever so slightly more cartoonish, but I think that's really just a function of the way that the 146's lighting actually looks in reality. There's plenty of night lighting options so we're not going to cover them all here, but you can pretty much configure every single light in the cockpit individually, and again overall I think the lighting very good, certainly some of the best lighting that we've seen so far in the sim. Lastly, before we conclude, we'll take a quick look at the onboard EFB. Firstly, we have the home page, pretty self-explanatory there really. No functionality, it's just a home page for the tablet, from which you can access the various menus. The OFP feature allows us to import flight plans from Simbrief, which is a nice touch. I know there are a couple of other add-ons that have the same functionality there as well, but it's certainly a very useful tool to have. We have a moving map feature, which is really nice, and I really like the quality of the mapping as well, seems to be very good overall. It's always nice to know where you actually are in the world, particularly if it's an area you're unfamiliar with. If you're on a longer flight, it's nice to be able to look out the window and associate a place with a name. It's really great to see that the aircraft has Navigraph capabilities on board, so we do have the option to display charts in the cockpit as opposed to having to display them externally. For me, that's a real bonus when it comes to immersion. I think it's a lot more immersive to actually view the charts on a tablet like this, as opposed to having to use an external display or a 2D pop-up. As we saw though during the flight, for some reason, I'm not entirely sure why, but it logged us out in the middle of the flight there. Maybe there's still a small bug or issue, we only had the chart application open for about an hour. The aircraft tab is probably one of the main tabs you're going to be using, from here we can configure the 146. We have various external equipment options, for example chocks, the GPU, we can open the various doors on the aircraft, as well as load fuel and passengers. We can also set various states, which is nice, we have the cold and dark state, ready for takeoff or a turnaround state. We have a few nice little cabin announcements as well, we didn't use those during flight, but you can make announcements to the cabin. There's a notes page, which isn't something I'd probably make much use of myself, but you can type in notes there, I suppose that would be quite useful for VATSIM. And lastly we have the settings page, which overall not too much functionality there, I was expecting to see a little bit more, but you can adjust a few options on the aircraft. Overall I think the tablet is pretty useful, it's got some really great functionality. Anyway, I think that just about covers everything that we didn't get a chance to look at during our flight. So we'll now finish up the video with my overall conclusions on the 146. So overall for me, once again, the Just Flight 146 is a really fun offering for the sim. It's the kind of aircraft I really enjoy flying, and I'm particularly fond of the 146, so I'm really happy to see it now within Microsoft Flight Simulator. As usual, we'll break the product down into my positives and negatives. 
Starting with the negatives, for me overall it did feel as though the product has been put out with still a few things that need fixing up. And there isn't anything egregious missing with the aircraft but there were a few things that I noticed along the way. For example, as I said, I couldn't access the cabin from the cockpit. So unless I made a major mistake there, and I don't think I have, I'm pretty positive that we were able to access the cabin in the 100 variant of the aircraft when we previewed it. I would hazard a guess there that the 300 currently doesn't have the cabin modelled internally. That's probably been skipped for the time being to get the aircraft out within the time frame that just flight set for themselves. The same goes for the FMC really. Again, overall it does work, so it's a usable aircraft, but I would have liked to have seen a custom FMC. And I suspect that the working title software there was used to save a little bit of time. I could be wrong on that one though, maybe the SDK functionality still wasn't there and for the time being that was the best that just flight can manage with what's available. I can certainly live with the cabin issues, I'm sure they will be fixed up at a later date. The same goes with the FMC, it certainly would have been nice at this sort of a price point to have seen a custom FMC, but just flight have stated that will come at a later date. And again, I do have every faith that they'll be true to their word, they've been excellent at updating products so far in the sim. In terms of the flight model, overall I thought the aircraft flew pretty nicely. It seemed to me to be a little bit twitchy in pitch though. We saw as well when the aircraft was trying to capture the ILS there, it was a little bit pitchy trying to get itself onto the glide slope. In terms of performance, I haven't really had a chance to look at how close the aircraft actually flies to the numbers. I'm sure that you can do that for yourselves watching the video back. We'll touch more on the flight model later on, as overall I think it's a nice flight model for the aircraft, but for me I still think that X-Plane holds the edge there. And I suspect that's a sim issue as opposed to an add-on issue. The click spots we discussed during the flight, but on the autopilot I find them to be a tiny bit hit and miss. Generally if you hold them down for long enough they certainly work, but if you just give them a quick click sometimes they don't catch. It may be that just like it's modelling the real behaviour of the aircraft there, for example, some switches on the Airbus don't actually operate unless you hold them down for a fraction more than just a click. But you can get a little bit caught out there if you do just click something and you miss that it hasn't actually armed. But you should always be checking your FMA, so you should hopefully pick that up. The external sounds of the aircraft, I wouldn't say they were particularly great. Usually external sounds are a bit of a forte of just flight, but these ones were adequate, nothing special. And in terms of the FPS, I would say pretty much what you'd expect. I was losing about 20 FPS versus the default Cessna 152. Of course though that is specific to my system. So the aircraft will take a chunk of your FPS but again that's to be expected. It is a very well modelled and fairly deep aircraft in terms of system simulation. Moving through to the positives. Overall for me one of the big positives. You get a ton of different variants and liveries with the aircraft. You're almost getting three or four products in one really. We get both the 100, the 200 and the 300 variant as well as passenger and cargo variants of the aircraft the military variant as well. Whilst you don't get every single operator of the 146 in terms of liveries, you certainly get a pretty decent chunk of them. So plenty of choice there, and again given the price I think you're getting very good value for money in terms of quantity. The liveries as we've discussed, they might not be 8k, but they certainly hold up very nicely at a distance. And Again I think that the texturing of the aircraft externally is very nice, it holds up pretty well, the PBR is good, modelling detail is great externally. Internally is where the aircraft holds up really well, I think there it's been modelled very nicely, and the texturing in the cockpit is excellent. Again, for the most part, the gauge is very crisp and very easy to read. Systems depth, we have already touched on a little. For my money, I think the systems depth is very good. Again, particularly at this sort of a price point. Basically, I do think that the quote-unquote study level quality is there. But of course, again, no failure modelling. There are certain systems that aren't usable in the cockpit, although they're pretty niche systems. I think in terms of jet aircraft, this is certainly the most comprehensively modelled add-on that I've seen so far in terms of its systems. And there's certainly more than enough depth there that you can accurately simulate getting the 146 from A to B. Flight model is a little bit trickier to say for me really, I've never flown the 146 and actually I've only ever flown fly-by-wire aircraft at least in the real world. I've flown a couple of more conventional aircraft in the sim. I would say in roll the aircraft handles pretty nicely, it's certainly pretty easy to hand fly. Again a little bit twitchy, a little bit sensitive in pitch, that does tend to be fairly typical with a Microsoft flight simulator. The rudder during the takeoff was fairly sensitive, but again that's not entirely unrealistic for a heavy jet. Usually you're just looking at putting in slight pressure on the rudder pedals to keep the aircraft straight down the runway. I'm just going off gut feeling here, I would say that the flight model of the aircraft isn't quite as study level as the systems modelling of the aircraft. But the aircraft does handle fairly pleasantly, it seems to perform broadly to the numbers. The automation seemed to work pretty well for the most part, it did seem a touch sensitive and skitterish at times. We saw it hunting around sometimes to find our flight plan leg. The aircraft did fly the ILS quite well, but again we saw it had a little bit of trouble initially capturing, and again that seems to affect most Microsoft Flight Simulator aircraft. I think most of us were probably hoping we'd see a slightly more solid behaviour from the aircraft, given that we're now moving into study level territory, and overall the aircraft did behave faultlessly, there was no major issue throughout the flight. I would say that there's room for improvement with the auto flight system, but again overall it ticked all the boxes and it did get the job done. 
Internal sounds I thought were great as well. The switches and cockpit controls all sound great. You can hear the cabin fans and the packs. The overall ambience in the cockpit is excellent. It's very immersive and overall it does give a pretty true to life feel. The same goes with the GPWS callouts and things of that nature. They were pretty good. And the FO callouts as well. They're fairly limited in terms of what you get, but they're a nice touch and they sound pretty good as well. Lastly, before we close up, I think it's worth touching on the pricing. Obviously, at this sort of a price point, we are expecting a quality product, but I think it's certainly worthy of praise that Just Flight did actually reduce the price based on customer feedback. I really hope that pays off for them. I hope it pays off for us as well. I think the product very much meets the sort of standards that I would be expecting at this price point. There is, again, certainly room for improvement, and I do think that the product was ever so slightly put out ahead of it being completely finished. But again, given the amount of variation, the amount of liveries that you get, and the fact that this aircraft is probably going to be the cheapest, again, quote-unquote, study-level aircraft that we're going to see in the sim, at least for some time to come. Overall, I think that the Just Flight 146 offers really good value. Again, for me, the 146 is an aircraft that I really enjoy flying. I'm sure we'll take it on many flights to come. It offers a really nice challenge. It's something a little bit different as well. The aircraft does have a lot of character, a lot of ambience, and overall, I think Just Flight have done a very sterling job with it once again. So there you go guys, that just about concludes our review of the Just Flight 146 Professional. As always, if you have any questions or comments for me, you can leave those down in the comment section below. If you enjoyed what you saw, then please consider giving the video a like. If you want to see more content from the channel, then please consider subscribing as well. As ever, a huge thank you to my channel members and patrons for all of your support, it's very much appreciated. As always guys, I hope you are having a great day wherever you are. Take really good care, and I will see you all again soon.